<laughs> Fermi, something like that. <laughs> oh, Dirac. Okay, Dirac. Oh, sorry. All right. It's a new type of uh, of uh, it's exotic particle with a T. Yeah. It's protects us, you know. It is a protects us. We didn't give it to last time. So oh, okay. Uh, oh, nice. Uh, that's right. Because now I'm not longer part of this one. Okay, great. Thank you. I never have one of these. Great. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful to be back uh, to the nice Texas weather. Um, with many, many friends. Uh, and this is actually a story that I wanted to tell you that uh, two years ago, I actually gave a colloquium here as well with a quick prediction that we just had made at that time. Um, we didn't realize it was going to be so bigly, like the like your president like to say. Um, uh, so then to, this one in this case is a story that is going to connect several things. I'll try to be as pedagogical as possible. Um, but it's one that I think in this case can have impacts, but it's also merging three or four different areas of physics, um, you know, so hopefully in the, in the, you know, I'll give you a flavor of where it's going. But above all, uh, I don't do anything myself anymore. I have a very nice team, very good looking team, um, with many nice uh, young folks, but here actually the main one, so he says that he was recovering from the party that he did when I left probably, uh, but he comes often enough, so essentially this is the work done primarily by four uh, team members, uh, visitor, permanent, almost permanent visitor in the, in the summers, in minds, as well as a fantastic student, uh, Libor Smekow, uh, and also some of you guys know Jacob Giles, uh, and also another fantastic uh, researcher of our team, uh, Helen uh, Gomonai. Uh, so the, the story is going to be, I'm going to give you a quick introduction, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about a thing called spin orbit torques, things that are utilized nowadays in the next generation of MRAM technology to move and manipulate uh, uh, magnetic uh, memories and how they came about, and how they were actually linked to a spin hole effect. And you guys should be linked a little bit to a spin hole effect, which is what's generated and predicted here, the first year that I was here in Texas A&M. Um, and this actually has had quite a few repercussions to lead into these type of things. And learning from this has given us a leap into this uh, dormant giant of materials that were not exploited before, which are now going to be going to be exploited. Uh, on different magnetic spintronics on how to manipulate them electrically and make devices out of them. And then the last part, which is the one that is the exciting part and the latest one, is how you're going to combine all of these things with topological physics, nail spin over torque and antiferromagnets all together in a nice uh, gift wrap. So we start always in condensed matter physics uh, with electron. It has two personalities to it, the spin and the charge. And those two parts of the personality of the electron are utilized for the most part, it's still separate within uh, the technology. Uh, the transistors are using, of course, the charge itself, uh, which is utilized to, to manipulate the, the data, uh, and the spins through ferromagnetism, primarily through the magnets, is the one responsible for the storing of information. Now, the first spintronics evolution, which had affected this is spintronics, is the marriage of these two uh, parts of personality of the, of the electron, which has affected all of our lives happen and you can see in the evolution that I like it from, I like it to call it from ink to spin uh, or digital to analog. As you can see, uh, you start, I'm from Gutenberg University now in Mainz, so I have to put here the, the most important analog version of, uh, of uh, storage of information. Uh, and the digital one, something happened around this year uh, and what happened is that uh, two scientists, uh, Peter um, Grunberg and Albert Hurd, realized that by, by sandwiching these very thin layer ferromagnets with a, a normal metal, they could control the resistance very strongly of one of the fer if, if they were parallel or anti-parallel. And this sensitivity allowed for the read heads to detect a smaller and a smaller domain, um, uh, domains um, of your magnetic disks where you store the information. Now, this of course wouldn't have been practical because it was in a laboratory and it would have been very expensive, but it was uh, Stuart Parkin, uh, who actually created uh, and they make it to, from the momentum to the practical by creating these similar devices with equal quality. And this is what eventually is in everybody's hard drives and also what made the cloud possible. Most of our hard drives are now a solid state, but these solid state drives are actually pretty slow. They're not really utilized for large computing. It's still a storage, 19 per, whatever 91 put in there of information is still all magnetic. But what is next in magnetic memory? The key thing here is now to go to marriage of this RAM technology of RAM memories that you actually have with a charge with magnetism. And there were first steps utilized in 19th century physics of just domain walls 
uh, sorry, of, of just uh, flipping the ferromagnets with just a magnetic field created by, by field lines. Uh, they were not very scalable. You cannot really go too much lower because of the scales of the magnetic fields and the long range of the magnetic fields. But then a, a phenomenon called a spin transfer torque uh, gave us the possibility to create a scalable and now what is actually now usable and commercial um, a, uh, what is called a spin transfer magnetic random access memory. Now, let me tell you what that phenomena is. The spin transfer torque is a, is a phenomena where you transfer angular momentum from one ferromagnet to the other. So a ferromagnet polarizes your electrons, then it goes through a normal, ferro normal layer of a normal metal, uh, nothing happens. And then here, it defaces. And what happens, once it defaces, it gives a zero total angular momentum to the lattice. But it gives the rest of the angular momentum, because it's conserved totally, uh, to the other ferromagnet and it torques it. This is what is called this term in here. When you look at the, 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 this uh, equation that dominates the rotation and the dynamics of magnetization, it is uh, like, a, like a gyroscope. Essentially, it has a gyroscopic motion around an effective magnetic field. It just got rotates. And it has a dissipation that puts it back into that field that it wants to point around. Uh, but this one uh, was the one that you could pump in and out magnetization, uh, angular momentum from one to the other or suck it out. Either way, depending on your, on your direction of, uh, of the current. Because here, J, in this case, is the current. Now, this is what now, uh, coupling it to this type of uh, bit cells, uh, magnetic tunnel junctions, you can now actually go to much smaller system sizes. You don't need to worry about magnetic fields being created. Um, and then, essentially, what you do, you pin down one of the ferromagnets, and depending on your current going in or out, you can flip the ferromagnet on top. But this is still a bit of a problem with that, because you need quite a lot of current to actually flip it. Essentially, you're flipping a large ferromagnet, so you need a kind of cloud flipping a building. You need to throw a lot of pebbles to actually throw away the building. So the flux of pebbles is very large in order to actually flip it around. Now, the problem is that the reading voltage for, for reading is not a problem, but for writing, you need quite a, large, uh, quite a large current. And this also means that sometimes the voltage that melts it will actually be just as large as the voltage that, uh, that you need to write for some of the bit cells. So instead of having a crash, you know, your actual heart is do crash, actually literally crash it like, a, like, a, like a jet on a mountain. Um, the physical mechanism is that, in this case, it will be you know, memory meltdown. Uh, some of the meltdown bits. Uh, but how to get around it, and this is where my field comes in a lot, uh, the spin electronics field, is where we now to begin to use a spin current instead of charge current to actually manipulate these things. And in this case, you need to marry more directly the charge and the spin degree of freedom. This happens, of course, by putting quantum mechanics and special relativity together that gives you the Dirac equation. This Dirac equation is essentially this phone line between the electric charge and the spin of an electron. It has several consequences, where just to introduce it to the students, it is one of the few echoes of a special relativity in solid state environments. The electrons themselves are going 100 at the speed of light, so in reality, it's not going to be a large energy scale in here. Uh, but on the other hand, as we've been told um, in, the, in, in, in classical electrodynamics, any electric field that is changing environment with time generates a magnetic field. So if an electron is moving around in a frame of reference where there's an electric field, uh, in the frame of reference of the electron, it will see some change in magnetic electric field proportional to the velocity of this electron. So it will actually see an effective magnetic field that is a cross product between its velocity and the electric field. And this it will interact with this electric field just like a spin will interact with it, uh, just like a Zeeman term. So it will process about it. It will have several consequences. You spin. No longer is just the degree of freedom of multiplied by two. Now you actually will have a preferred axis of direction. If you are moving to the right and your electric field is in this direction, your effective magnetic field is this one, and then you will have a you know in the uh, against state in that direction or the other. But if you inject an electron that is not lined up with this effective magnetic field, what happens is that you start processing. Okay, you've seen this before for some of my talks before. It also has another important consequence. It's called the mod scattering. And it's actually interesting that this was the first test of the Dirac equation. And it's actually this mod scattering happens to be how you actually polarize electrons in these large colliders. Uh, if you have an impurity here, essentially if you have a spin uh, up or down, it will have an asymmetry on how it will scatter one way or the other. This is called the mod scattering. Now, how is that 
coming together is to create this thing of a spin orbitronics where you now begin to cu couple this is spin and orbital degree of freedom together to give you new phenomena. Phenomena that is not only characterized for it, but originates from it. Uh, one of them is the story today is going to be about going from the spin hole effect of how this actually has given out the spin orbitorics that now are actually going to be practical and go around this problem of meltdown to now a new material, the spin and different magnetic spin of electronics. And now the last step of it will be just to make the, the whole network uh, to connect it to topology. And there's new degrees of freedom and essentially doing high energy physics uh, at the solid state level. Uh, so the first thing is the spin hole effect. Uh, some of you already know it. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with it. If you think about this uh, symmetric of a spin ups going to one side, and spin downs going to the other, if you have impurities in the in the material, in the paramagnetic material, uh, with some symmetries being broken, you will end up having a spin current uh, that is actually perpendicular to the motion of the electrons as you run a current. Uh, so this is spin current was predicted, uh, it is intrinsic one, and extrinsic one was predicted different times, and then directly observed almost immediately after our prediction, uh, a year later, but this one generates essentially a spin current perpendicular to a charged current. It's a spin current generator, or an angular momentum generator. I want to explain to you a little bit how it works, particularly the intrinsic one, which is the one utilized nowadays because it's the strongest one. Uh, and it's easy to see it in a, in a system that is two-dimensional. So here I'm plotting just an electron in a two-dimensional with the momentum just doing this circle. This is the Fermi, uh, the Fermi uh, vector, wave vector. And a spin orbit coupling that po points the effective magnetic field perpendicular um, to the momentum. Okay, so you can imagine that the electric field is pointing in the z direction. What means is that if uh, in equilibrium they're standing like this, and as you accelerate an electron, so you push this electron, as it changes its momentum, it will change effectively its effective magnetic field perpendicular to this effective change in momentum, and that will make it process just like I showed here. Okay. And then that creates, if you see this, you have a spin down moving to the right and a spin up moving to the left. So that creates a spin current going from here to there. Okay, not a charge current. So the charge current will be actually zero. Uh, you would actually have a spin current. This is why it's intrinsic. It's intrinsic because it involves the coherent um, uh, rotation of an electron, which requires a coherence between two states in order to have this precession. And it happens in between collisions. But at the same time that that happens, one thing that we shouldn't forget, and we actually utilize this in the first experiment that we observed is, you also have a, a production of polarization, not a spin current, but net polarization in your system due to similar symmetries. And this one comes from a slightly different reasons, is that here, if you have your electron in equilibrium and you run a current, what you're also doing is, po is populating more electrons that were here to that side, that we have a net current going to the right of electrons, Okay, uh, but then now you can also count as well, you know, before you had non-net polarization, but once you actually do this redistribution of, polariza of, of the electrons and the, in, around the Fermi uh, distribution function, you end up with a net polarization on the plane. And both of them happened in the spin hole effect experiment that where we first observed the, this is intrinsic spin hole effect in two-dimensional gases. The bottom one shows you the up and down a spin current of the of the uh, spin hole effect, and this one is a test of showing this Einstein effect, or sometimes called inverse Pilgerbach effect. Uh, the two of them are important for the following reason. Remember what I told you about uh, this melting down. Okay, so here you're transferring angular momentum from this ferromagnet to this other ferromagnet, and if you run too much current, because you are going through what's called a metal thermal junction, the most resistive part of your element, you end up melting. You know, I square R. R is very large. On the other hand, if you were able to manage to split this ferromagnet by running a current through the metal, because your resistance now is a metallic, much, much lower, you would never have a problem of meltdown. The question is how to do that. And about four years ago, five years ago now, uh, there was two experiments that excited a lot of people uh, where they ran a current in a, in a layer. You have, it's a bilayer system where you have a heavy metal, platinum, in this case, tantalum in this one, and a cobalt, uh, some um, uh, ferromagnet on top, and an oxide on the top. So essentially, it has broken inverse, uh, structural inversion symmetry broken. And they ran a current, and they were able to flip the ferromagnet just by running a current through the system. 
uh, not through the not by transferring uh, direct current through the system. There were two interpretations to it. One was it that they say, well, you know, remember this polarization that I'm generated at this interface because this is spin of a couple of that interface. Therefore, if I have that and I have magnetization of my local moments there, I should be able to, if I'm not lined up with this, with this uh, non-equilibrium polarization, I should be able to flip the ferromagnet with that because it's an effective magnetic field. It has like an effective field to that magnetization that makes it rotate. On the other hand, this other guy said, well, no, 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 not so fast. That's not the case. It actually is coming from a spin hole effect because if I run a current, a current through this heavy metal, then I'm going to generate a spin current perpendicular to it that is going to flux into the ferromagnet and it's going to be absorbed and it's going to flip it, okay? Just for the spin transfer uh, torque, that uh, mechanism that I mentioned to you before. So it will be a combination of a spin hole effect and a spin transfer torque. These are the combination because it is always happening within a system that is ferromagnetic and has a spin orbit coupling is what is usually called a spin orbit torque or what we, I like to call the spin orbit torque because the origin comes from that. It's effectively like making a ferromagnet become a cat. A cat can flip itself, the same thing would be here. In this other interpretation, you still need the spin current being generated from somewhere else. Okay. Now, we actually had, so there was actually a lot of debate about the origin of these mechanisms because these have been observed, these mechanisms, the fact that you have a field-like, an anti-damping-like, they, you know, they, they create different motions of the, of the magnetization, and a field-like for the Rashba one, or the, or the spin orbit coupling with the anti magnet. And we realized there was actually one missing in here. This is what we did a couple of years ago. Well, we predicted that in reality, if you have a spin orbit coupler in your ferromagnet, so you have a ferromagnet with broken inversion symmetry, you can also make it behave like a cat because in reality you need this anti-damping, this dynamical way of flipping. You can see why it can happen. Uh, if, I sh if you remember what I showed you about the, uh, the, the spin hole effect, let's go back and now put a ferromagnet with it. So now, in before I had uh, the rush bar, essentially there's no net polarization. But in this case, I'm going to have one because I'm going to make these carriers live together with the magnetization. Okay, so there's a local moments that point in this direction and the carriers that can move point in this direction and they're dominant. Behind this, but not as strong, this is still this rush by spin orbit coupling with this uh, chirality. So when you actually run the current now, in this case, you still generate this out of equilibrium, when you increase your momentum, you're going to have a polar, an effective magnetic field still in the same direction as you did there, but now because your electrons were already anti-parallel to the magnetization, they're all both going to flip, and you're not going to generate a spin current, but a polarization out of the plane. Not in the plane, but out of the plane. One of the key important things to be dynamic in this case is that this polarization that you're generating depends on the angle between the current and the magnetization direction. If it didn't depend on that, it would be feel like. It would be just like a magnetic field external one that you just process about. And in this case, you can see that it does because if I'm actually putting this thing perpendicular to this, so in this case it will be the strongest, but if I put it perpendicular, nothing will happen. Because if I run the current, the polarization, the, the, the effective field is in the same direction as my original polarization. So there will be no precession of electrons. So in that case, there will be zero polarization generated by this current. So you end up uh, with an effective polarization, delta, uh, delta Z, that has a cosine dependence in its angle, for example. Uh, all the messages that you want to take in this case, in this case, it will have a different symmetry that you can detect in your experiment, in your fMR ferromagnetic resonance experiment. <coughs> we actually, I'm going a little faster than that because I want to get to the, to the other physics of, the, of this anti-ferromagnet. Uh, but this is where we actually learn some of these things. In the, in the actual system that we did the experiment, it was gallium magnetic assassinated, the little magnetic semiconductor that we can control very well. Uh, and the prediction was that it will have this Dresselhaus symmetry. Uh, you can measure this thing by doing what is called an inverse uh, for a magnetic resonance experiment, where you take a single gallium magnetic astenite, you run a current through it, that becomes your small magnetic field, and you extract it uh, from analyzing the resonance shape. And once you extract it, you can look at the data uh, in different directions, and then you can see the dependence as is predicted by theory. Now, I went quickly through this, but let me stop here for a second to tell you what we did with this effect. Now, unlike the other systems where you needed um, to have a complicated uh, ferromagnet with a heavy metal interface to actually make things flip, this one 
is a single ferromagnet. You just looked for a ferromagnet that has a broken inversion symmetry, a particular lattice structure, and is generating angular momentum from the lattice itself in a coherent way, okay? And be able to flip itself like a cat, just depending on which direction the current flows, literally. If you think of a cat, they just drop it in its back, it can flip itself by transferring angular momentum from one place to the other in its, in its body, similar in here in this particular case with the spin orbit torques. Um, so that's one of the exciting things. Now, we did this in, in a... In a, in a Antiferromag in a semiconductor, which is low temperatures, so it would be totally impractical. The next step was to actually go to metal. This is where Jacob Giles was involved. And he predicted, in this case, with his calculations, that nickel manganese and timonite will have a particular dependence of this field. And they were observed recently and published last year in Nature Physics uh, by our collaborators, experimental collaborators, Ticharelli et al. So now the nice thing is now it's in metals. And you can actually make this practical in a particular uh, device. But now, let me, so this was the quick thing of how we actually have utilized the spin hall effect and now created these spin orbit torques that are actually being thought about uh, to be utilized in magnetic random access memory because they turn out to be faster. Not more efficient, but faster than the spin transfer torque uh, mechanisms. But now, why antiferromagnets? Why, because, you know, I've just been talking for 25 minutes or so about something that is not antiferromagnets. Why the dormant, guys? So antiferromagnets spintronics is quite important. I think it's important because as a material, antiferromagnets, the problem with antiferromagnets is that they're fairly invisible to external magnetic fields. If you put a magnetic field because of the orientation, antiferromagnet essentially has opposite sublattices of the local spins pointing in opposite directions, but they're still magnetically ordered. So time reversal is broken, uh, but if you put a magnetic field, you need a very strong magnetic field to make them count it and then manipulate them a little bit. Uh, so they are insensitive to magnetic fields. They also, because in this case, it will be all a spin-generated type of mechanisms. They will be radiation hard. It will not be affected by the radiation explosions, for example. Um, you also have a very natural terahertz dynamics. So here you actually can able to couple directly at the terahertz range, optical range, and be able to actually have what is called the terahertz gap between about 0.3 and 3 terahertz. We actually have no way to communicate between electronics and optics. Uh, which is a big, big problem. And this one will be the natural material to do so. And actually, we just have some experiments. Uh, they have uh, colleagues of ours, Thomas Yarnworth, which is my longtime collaborator, has actually some fantastic results on that end. Uh, on the other hand, it will have a very, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tunable, uh, multiple stable magnetic state logic. And most important of all, there's more materials. You may not realize, but all of you are paying about 10 bucks a year. Every single one in this earth is paying 10 bucks a year to the actual storage industry on ferromagnets on about four materials. Because not many materials are ferromagnets or practical ferromagnets that you can use. Most materials don't want to be ferromagnets. They are, if you lower the temperature, it's going to be a superconductor, maybe most of the time anti-ferromagnet, but definitely not so much ferromagnet. So there's a lot more range of materials to use. But in my field is spinovitronics, so I want to do antiferromagnetic spinovitronics now. And I'm going to exploit what we just actually did, which was uh, this idea of a spin orbit torque star that you're essentially flipping the, the ferromagnet by itself by generating this, this non equilibrium polarization, but apply this to antiferromagnets. And how am I going to do that? So you got this, uh, uh, probably I'm going very, very quickly. I'm sorry, I just give you probably a flavor of these things. Um, in this case, if you run a current, you create this non-equilibrium polarization in a ferromagnet, that you, and if you're not lined up with this direction of the, the magnetization, it's not lined up with this, it will be able to flip it. We were able to do this in the ferromagnet calamagnetic arsenide. But we realize one aspect that is important, which is to notice that um, if you have a central symmetric system that has, that the spin orbit coupling itself is a very local thing. It, ha it comes from the core electrons. Uh, deep inside of the atoms. And now, if you have uh, two sublattices systems that are coupled together that have inversion symmetry, you need inversion symmetry to have this thing be non zero. What we'll translate to is the fact that if you have these two partners, this is a, a lattice structure where it is central symmetric overall, but if you look at this sublattice and this sublattice, these gold atoms in a different spot as this one, you see, that's up top, that's in the bottom. So the two are coupled together, and that translates to the fact that. Locally, within a unit cell, they have different spin textures. Equilibrium spin textures due to spin orbit coupling. 
This is changing within the unit cell, which is too fast for anything that we can actually physically measure for normal probes, external probes. Okay. But on the other hand, the prediction would be that if you run a current through this imps, this is, would be the equilibrium texture of one sublattice and the other sublattice. Okay. Uh, so the, this, this, this blue and red uh, and purple, sorry. But if you, because you have this structure of this rush bar that I've mentioned to you with the symmetry, if you run a current through the system, the prediction will be that you actually have opposite non-equilibrium polarization generated in opposite sublattices. And here was the deal. That yes, we don't have the actual probes to look at this change of, uh, of a spin polarization in that scale, except that nature gave it to us. That is the antiferromagnet itself because the antiferromagnet has opposite spins in opposite sublattices coming from different parts of the spins. These are the carriers. The other spins will be the local spins that you can couple to, and you effectively are creating different anisotropies. If you run a current through the system, the anisotropy will want to point that way instead of that way, okay, just by running a current through it. This was the prediction, and we actually did the calculation on a particular system. It was called manganese to gold, uh, but it also happens to be for copper manganese arsenide. And then... Why is it um, important is because, you know, in this case, if you run this current, uh, you will be able for the first time to manipulate the orientation of the antiferromagnet just by an electrical means. Okay? This is, I went very fast, but let me understand, make you understand. Antiferromagnets for a long time, these materials that are actually very utilized, are utilized in your systems right now just as inactive elements of your devices. They're used to pin ferromagnets. They don't move. They stay there. Okay? To, advoc to actually make them move, you will need like 10 Tesla, a lot of very large flips, very large magnetic fields, by a magnetic field. If you're able to manage to move them electrically, now you can actually address them, see the orientation, and actually utilize them for devices. So that was the prediction that I think it was the last thing I said in that colloquium very quickly. Probably nobody remembers. Hopefully it's like me that I don't remember what I ate for lunch. Um, so this is a little bit of how it's worked because I went very fast. In reality, imagine that you have your, your very nasty advisor and you tell your part of a student, you say, I want you to go to this lattice, to this material, and very cautiously create these coils with opposite uh, chirality in opposite sublattices. So you create these little solenoid coils in each of the sublattices. So if you see this, this one is in this direction, the other one is in the opposite direction. And if you run a current through it, what you're effectively doing is actually just reorienting the nail order parameter. You see? It's literally what you're doing. Because you're telling it, oh, that's my preferred direction. If you run it in the opposite direction, it will be 90 degrees from that. Due to the spin of it coupling. Due to the scupping of the spin and the, and the charge degree of freedom. Okay. Now that seemed like a wild idea, but we seem to have a good record of predictions and uh, and um, and observations. And a year later, uh, Thomas Youngworth and his team we managed to actually observe it for the first time in copper manganese arsenide. So here you see in the first bit cell, it was published in Science in February of last year, uh, where you're running the current in this case. And one of the nice things with uh, ferromagnets, um, antiferromagnets. I mean, Mott, who got the Nobel Prize for this, of course, he said that are practical but useless. They're interesting but useless. Uh, but on the other hand, they have an isotropic magnetic resistance, just like ferromagnets. So you're able to tell just by a change in resistance whether they are oriented in one direction or the other, or, the, or if the orientation has changed. So effectively, what this is doing, you run a current through the a pulses of terahertz pulses to this side, and then you look at how the current is changing. And it's, uh, it's actually much better now. It's actually much more reproducible. And the, the pulses are, are very large, large, long pulses, but in reality, things are happening at a very fast rate, almost of the terahertz regime. Now, this, of course, is a, just a, 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 you know, you say, oh, that's just an experiment, you know, a device. But we actually decided, uh, they actually decided, because one of the experimenters there had a, a, a brother-in-law who owned an a IT company, and they were actually able to put this in a motherboard and actually switch it and co couple it to a Mac. I don't know if it works in the, in the, in the, in the PCs, but in the Mac it definitely works. Uh, sorry about that. It doesn't work in my other Mac, maybe, maybe in the stupid uh, new Mac not, but uh, anyway. So now you go in, in less than one year from a prediction uh, to a discovery to a device. 
It's not a very large device. It has, you know, five, six bits or something like that. Uh, but definitely you can see now the device connected there. So you are witnessing there the first uh, anti-ferromagnetic electrical memory ever. You should remember this today. So you can tell your grandkids when you say, you know, this anti-ferromagnetic memory that you have everywhere now, I saw for the first time in a colloquium in Texas A&M. Please remember that. Give me credit for that, okay? That's the only thing I, I ask of you. Now, okay, so that's been fun. You know, we predicted, we got this new device. Uh, but, but, you know, we're still not there. Um, because, uh, you know, you have these Dirac fermions and these topological things that you've been hearing about. You have a Nobel Prize recently for it. Uh, as well as our field that I've been about, spin hall effect, spin orbit torque, nail spin orbit torques. It actually started about the same time, 2003, 2004. Uh, with graphene, the discovery of graphene, but they've been developed rather independently, which is amazing that they've been actually going fairly independently. And uh, the idea, and particularly this is the idea of this fantastic student, uh, uh, Libor uh, Esmechel, this is one of the brightest students I've ever witnessed and had the pleasure to work with. Um, and he said, you know, hi, you know, Thomas is actually Thomas Younger's student. He now is staying with us because it's a lot more fun and his girlfriend is nearby. So that's an advantage. Uh, and, you know, how about if we marry the two? What would happen? You know, can we do this? Can we actually, you know, we've seen the LSP orbit torques and all these things. We've seen topological physics. Uh, you know, can we couple them together somehow uh, and then control them? The answer, of course, is yes, at least in our predictions. Um, now, in relativistic physics, topological, seven metal spin 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 effects, you've seen the fact that, you know, these relativistic quasi particles, you have these two types so that, that, you know, uh, Libra has been teaching me about the Dirac fermions and the vial fermions. Uh, they're slightly different, uh, the two. Uh, but now they're actually in graphene itself, which was discovered uh, uh, for the first time in 2004, or, or created uh, for the first time in 2004. Uh, you actually have a representation of these Dirac quasi-particles in a solid state environment. So you don't really need all these big accelerators or anything like that. Where's, where's Alexi? You know, oh, he's not here. OK. Uh, I should have said that because I'm staying in his house. Uh, but uh, in the other hand, uh, what actually was driving a lot of these physics was these ca calculations, these band structure calculations, where within the band structure of a, of a material, you can identify uh, these crossings uh, that are actually indeed behaving essentially effectively like these relativistic quasi-particles. Of course, with the velocity renormalized a hell of a lot, okay, it's not going at the speed of light at all, okay, but it's still behaving exactly the same way. But they were primarily experimentally observed through photoemission, just looking at the band structure with photoemission, not as a direct effect, or you could control them at all in any way. Uh, and then so you have the two types, as I said. Uh, this is the, the Dirac and the vial. Uh, the vial lives in three dimensions. And then, you know, here all you got to take the message is that, you know, they, they have very complicated arrangements of the electrons, but you end up with very exotic things like these uh, nodal uh, lines and uh, not only no, not, not only direct points but also nodal lines etc uh, that need to be studied what the effects of them will be uh, at a particular stage but the key thing is okay now you have observed them can you control them and marry the things together the answer for them to for a magnet is yes of course um, uh, and then the key thing is the following here I have in the right the uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics and on the left the topological physics uh, since, you know, it has four Nobel Prizes in between them, so it's not too bad. Now, but they're separated. And then what it means is that uh, why antiferromagnets are important is because they have an overlap of two symmetries, okay? Uh, if you have two sides per unit cell, you end up with these band crossings, which is what happens uh, in graphene, in this case, uh, that can give you these uh, stable uh, direct points. But also here, uh, you, ha you have... Uh, parity, inversion symmetry, and time reverse asymmetry broken, but PT is conserved, you also can have uh, these things being at the same place at the same time. Okay? So these two things uh, are shared. So both the fact that you have two sublattices and they have PT symmetry for both, allowing you for, in this case, uh, this, this, this parity broken, in this case, uh, uh, gives you uh, the, the spin orbit torque. Okay? Now, if you do the calculation, you can actually do a simple model uh, that gives you this effective Hamiltonian. Where here, what I'm trying to plot in here is the energy of this crossing point. So you, you know, they think, look at me in this line, in the line of zero, where you see a bunch of crossing points, a lot of crosses in here, more or less. 
But these crosses depend on the orientation. This n is the nail order parameter of this, the direction of the antiferromagnet, of where it points. And you can see that it's opening and closing. So this one, in this particular orientation, will be there. But if I have it in a different orientation, it will open up. Okay? If you have it in, the, in this direction, in the 45 degree angle, it will open up and this one will go there, for example. You, no, because in this case, the symmetry, this has a, 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 a non-symorphic symmetry that protects it, in this case. So there's actually a symmetry uh, that has to protect it. In this case, um, I didn't want to go into that, but uh, in this case, if, if there was no symmetry protecting you, you will uh, repel. But in this case, you have a non-symorphic symmetry, which in this case has to do with uh, a non-symorphic means that you do a translation plus a point group operation um, that protects you in this case. Now, of course, this is for a simple model uh, that you can cook up directly of what would allow you to have it, uh, where essentially in this effective Hamiltonian, you're allowed to have both, you have an antiferromagnetic order parameter, and you have both these quasi-particles, these Dirac fermions uh, and Vial fermions, and, uh, and the uh, spinorbid torques. But it also happens in copper manganese arsenide. Okay, and then the calculation here is done in copper manganese arsenide in a tetrahedral and an orthorhombic format. And the orthorhombic is quite interesting. Uh, of, it's just how the structure looks like. It's uh, quite interesting because it's a semi-metal. Essentially, the crosses are happening close to the Fermi surface. And not only that, you can control the direction of them. So essentially, you can control whether they're actually gapped or not, just as uh, Valerie just was pointing out. Um, you will have this opening and closing of the gaps depending if you're protected at those particular points, depending on the direction of the nail or parameter. Because that symmetry, that non symmetric symmetry, depends on which direction your spins point. Okay? So if you point them in different directions, it will actually be, be uh, you know, uh, obeyed or not obeyed. Uh, it will be conserved or not conserved. And you can see this, for example, if you have the 100 direction and the 111 direction, whether it opens or closes. And these are calculations that with the spin of a couplet included in it. Uh, yeah, but uh, our team looks unhappy, but that's okay. Uh, now, he always looks unhappy. Uh, now, in this case, uh, so the, the, one of the nice things that we've been, that we've been discovering with this is that now, of course, in this particular one, this is actually the one that we actually, um, uh, that, that they actually observe the spin orbit torque. So in this particular case, you would be able, by current, orient the ferromagnets. In this one, unfortunately, it's not where they have shown the spin over the nail spin over torques to exist, so we don't know if it will work or not basically in terms of experiment. Uh, and here, of course, because the crosses don't happen very close to the Fermi surface, the consequences of this opening up or not is not so clear. But this gives you a room if you believe that in the in the orthogonal case you would actually have this effect. We now, by controlling with the current, the nail order parameter. So now you have antiferromagnetic spin uh, uh, spintronics with nail spin orbit torques. You can control the direction of your nail order parameter or the, or the, uh, the, the stagger fields and open and close the gaps. Okay, so you end up with the ultimate uh, anisotropic magnetic resistance if you think about it. Because if you happen to be in the thrombic where, you, where the crossing is on the, in the Fermi surface or close to the Fermi surface, if you open the gap, you become an insulator. If you close it, you know, if you close it, they become a metal, or a close to a metal. At a final temperature, of course, it will not be a perfect insulator. Uh, but that gives you a, an isotopic magnetic resistance that will be huge, or bigly, you know, whichever one you like. Okay? Sorry, I couldn't help it. You know, it's not my fault. <laughs> I voted. Okay, so, so this is the prediction. Uh, and this is one of those things that... But in this particular case, I'm excited about because it's kind of it's just a scratch in the surface uh, of of these new materials that have become practical because we learned about the challenges that we had. Um, so we started uh, just to summarize. Oh, I'm, I'm actually quite done early, but I'm going to say something about maybe spice. Maybe I talk too fast. Too much coffee. Uh, so you have you know you start from the spin hole effect and that give you the idea of a spin orbit to manipulate ferromagnets. Then with this, we learn about how to utilize this antiferromagnets to manipulate antiferromagnets electrically and actually create a device, a real device. And then we marriage these things with fermionic of uh, Dirac quasi particles, viral particles, particles, and control them directly by just running the current through this material with a particular symmetry.
Uh, and this would, I think, will have a new level of exploration because it really is coupling a lot of different fields, even at the, uh, at the level of optics, which has not even, even begun to, um, uh, to do. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, the people to thank for all these things is, uh, is these guys that have done all the work. Okay. Uh, but I also want to introduce the idea this uh, Archem has enjoyed, uh, that you may have received. Some of you complain that I bombard with all this spam mail and things like that. But in reality, if, if you have a chance at some point, uh, you can come to Mainz uh, or stop by. As many of you uh, fly through, through Frankfurt. Mainz is actually if, near Frankfurt. It's 20 minutes. Actually, most of the stewards stay in, in Mainz, not in Frankfurt, uh, from the flights that land in Frankfurt. And there we put together this, this, this center from these things that I, I received when I went moved to, uh, to Germany. Because, uh, you, know, you know, NSF, the problem with NSF is there's not sufficient funding. It turns out that DFG stands for Deutsche Funding is generous. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was able to utilize uh, the research funding to actually create this uh, interdisciplinary workshop where you really are bringing together two different communities together all the time. So each of the time for these workshops, I always ask the question, what am I going to learn? If I'm not going to learn, if there's always been tronics, it's no need. You know, there's all the venues for that. Uh, but there's lots of uh, activities going on um, that you can come and visit uh, and, uh, and enjoy them. Also, uh, we actually have a YouTube channel that you can enjoy the hours you know, while you're idling in the between flights or something, uh, where you can see all the talks themselves if you find them interesting. Uh, and uh, Minds itself has some entertainment features. You know, you have nice castles where we actually, this is where we actually have a whole some of the workshops. Uh, and we have a little bit of wine, as you can see, you know. I also have myself a little bit of wine, but that will be uh, uh, different. You will have to know me better. <laughs> okay, with that, thank you very much for your time. Hans. I hope you very eloquently describe how you switch spin, uh, spins mm -hmm. and write memories. Mm -hmm. Could you also say a little bit about how to read out the, the switch speed? Yeah, so in this case, the fantastic thing with the AMR, with this one, by the device works, is because we're using anisotropic magnetic resistance. The beauty about this is that um, you just need to know, measure the resistance, which is a very simple measurement. Because here you have anisotropic magnetic resistance, it means that your resistance differs if you, if you run the current in this direction, if your magnetization has different orientation. And it will both be present both in ferromagnets and in antiferromagnets because it's an m square effect. It doesn't really depend on just m pointing this way or that way. And this is how we actually, the measurements that I showed you, they are AMR effects, which is why they can actually couple directly to the, an electric measurement, directly there to the, to the device. So the USB device that you see, you're able to switch these things with a, with a terahertz pulse, okay? But you're able to measure it by just a, a current, which couples perfectly directly to your CMOS device, however you like it. Now, there is another way of switching spins. You can put a microwave field in mm -hmm. and switch them around. Would the current change then? Well, but, uh, this is, uh, I didn't say that, but uh, the, the, the actual uh, from a spin orbit torques that I showed you, these FMR essentially are at, at uh, microwave fields running through the material. So you're creating a ferromagnetic resonance at those microwaves within the material. Yeah, for example, in the in the uh, in some of the systems are pretty clean. Uh, they can be depending on how, of course, they are small devices. Um, in the um, we actually have uh, we also there's also more data about XMLD where you can actually see uh, the, the size of the domains. In the first experiments in the science paper, it was actually some creeping. So essentially, you're running these pulses and you're essentially reorienting different uh, domains. Okay, so there was some creeping in the domains. In the latest versions, uh, because they are grown on a different material, much more applicable towards CMOS. Uh, I cannot say what it is. But uh, that one itself has almost no in-plane anisotropy, so the flipping is very quick and very easy, and they have very large domains, also like micrometers domains. This is pretty exciting. Yeah. Which is rare, because antiferromagnets typically have smaller domains. You're not allowed to. Uh, you want to come this summer? Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. So, in that vial, 
uh, not even the calculations that we did, and you could, it, experimentally, you could uh, create an epi layer. Oh, sorry. In the Valsheim methods that he talked about in here, uh, I was leaving this wonderful picture of the line. Okay, so this one, he wants to know if you, this Fermi level, if you can control it or not. I actually want to know. Also. Yeah, so in order if you can control the, if you can control that. Um, so, I mean, the typically things that you can do, because these are bulk materials, you can do epi layers, very thin films. But in this case, of course, whether at the thin films you're going to end up here or not, you can, you can then uh, tune them. This one particularly would be gateable, because you have very small uh, carry con uh, carriers here. And that's actually gateable. This one you will never be able to gate, because yeah, you cannot gate a metal. Uh, but this one, you would be able to definitely gate it. Yeah, that's the idea. Well, I mean, that's a prediction, but we just, this is last week, it got accepted to be so you know, we'll see. Next year, in a couple of years. Another question is that the gap filter the closes, depending on the mm -hmm. rotation, it would mean for the monetization additional anisotropy. Yes, what, yeah. Right, so, so, first of all, it can be checked, right? Yeah. Second, if you gate it, and not only that, I mean, also there's an important aspect uh, that I was talking to, to, to Alexei. You know, he has had to listen because he was using his laptop, so he couldn't even, you know, check his email for a guy. Um, uh, that um, these Vial and Dirac uh, fermions, for example, have different um, magneto-optical responses, particularly Sigma X1, and optical ones as well. And I think it is not really discussed in the literature too much of what are the consequences of them in terms of the transport. And that's what we're trying to understand now. Uh, because that's never really been calculated. At least, maybe different pieces have been here and there, but not collectively. Because it was never really, I mean, this is just now that they, they realize that these two materials, these dormant giant of materials can really have uh, have a lot of things, a lot of very neat physics. In it. Yeah. So how, how, how do you affect this optical response? Well, actually, the, the experiment was with terahertz pulses, optical pulses, terahertz uh, optical pulses. Femtosecond pulses. Yeah. These experiments that I show you here, they now actually been able to do them with terahertz pulses. These ones, uh, they, the pulses themselves, the terahertz pulses are optical. Shoom, laser. Can you go back to the first one? Which, which one? The last one you had up here. Which? The, the very last one which showed the different, uh, it had energy against ABC or something. Oh, th this? No, the, the very last slide of spaghetti. The spaghetti flow? Okay. Yeah, sorry. At the very end. The very end. Sorry, this is this little slow. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, one, yeah this okay. One. So I understand energy and, and band gap at the yeah. level. But what is, what, what is M A C U N? This is particular uh, uh, symmetry points in the Brillouin zone. This is momentum space. This is this is Jonas, Sam, Robert, Theodore. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is crystallographic points in the in the brilliant zone yeah. that are usually how they are plotted. This is spaghetti plots are they usually how they are plotted. Essentially, they, this corresponds to these lines. So T Z is means that you go in momentum space between T and Z. So where's the okay? I chose the wrong one. <laughs> Z and U. Where is the hell is Z? Okay, Z. Okay, come on. Are you kidding me? <laughs> All right, I should have paid more attention. Okay, gamma man. There you go. So this line in here is like plotting. Your momentum as it moves in this direction, you see? And you look at the energy. You wrap it all around, and then you twist it. And then... Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, guys.